we uh, glanced at, at verse 44 of Luke 24 last time. Just to look at this one phrase, these are the words. I wanted us to see that what was happening, what they were seeing, the things that were coming to pass before their very eyes are the words. What's happening this morning? It's what the Lord promised. These are the words that he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. That's coming to pass right now. Everything that he says comes to pass exactly as he says it would. He told them what would happen. They saw all of it happen. And yet he does not appeal to their sense of sight. It doesn't say in verse 45, look at verse 45 there, the next verse that we'll look at. It doesn't say, then opened he their understanding that they might understand what was right before their eyes. And things unfolded before the very eyes of people that they had no idea what was going on. Those who watched him die on Calvary, most there didn't know what was happening. Only those that he reveals the truth to, that he was redeeming his people there. He wasn't giving mankind a chance. He was redeeming his people there. He was offering his very soul a sacrifice for the sins of his elect. And he accomplished everything that his precious blood was shed in order to accomplish. He said it's finished. He didn't say it's available. He said it's finished. And most now, when, when the gospel is preached and the cross, so to speak, is revealed from the word of God, they don't know what happened there. That's most people's problem. They don't know what happened at Calvary. They just don't because God's got to open your understanding. But he did do that that they might understand the scriptures, not what they were seeing, the scriptures. Sinners are not saved by being given visions or by experiencing new revelations. Notice the, the, that the Lord said, these are the words I spoke to you before when I was with you. This is something he had already said. He had been saying that from the beginning. God's message to sinners does not change. It's the same from the beginning and always will be. His words are our doctrine now. He said these things a couple of thousand years ago, and these are the words that you'll hear this morning because his words are our doctrine. And sinners are saved by grace by the free grace of God through faith in his son, if God's going to show his grace to you, grace is always saving grace. There's no other kind of grace. It saves when God gives you grace. It's not him helping you along the way. It's him saving you. And when he does that, he does it through means of believing on Christ as revealed in the scriptures and preached in the gospel. The Holy Scriptures are able to make a sinner wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. So he referred them to the Scriptures, even though he was standing right there in front of them. It's the Word of God that's the means that the Lord uses to save his people. The Lord describes the Scriptures here as Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That's all of the Old Testament scriptures. Moses is the first five books of the Bible. And of course, all of the prophets and then the Psalms. That's everything. All of the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say? What does the Old Testament say? A lot of places say, well, the Old Testament's not valid anymore. We have the New Testament now. 
What's the message of the Old Testament? Well, he tells us that here too. Concerning me. Concerning me. I'd say that's relevant, wouldn't you? It concerns God's Son. Also, the gospel message from the scripture is all musts and no maybes. You see that in there? That all things must be fulfilled. It must be as he has spoken it. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So you know what he did? He saved his people from their sins. It's musts. There's no maybes. Christ must needs have suffered, was Paul's message in the synagogue. In Acts 17, 3, all whom the Father, God the Father, loved and chose in eternity shall come to me, he said in John 6, 37. That's a must. And all whom the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed on Calvary with his precious blood, everybody he shed his blood for, Everybody he represented in John 17, in his great high priestly prayer, he said, I don't represent the world. I'm praying for those you gave me. As he went to Calvary, that's who he interceded for. That's who he shed his blood for. Those that the Father had given him in the eternal covenant of grace. And all that he redeemed on Calvary, he must bring to himself in salvation. He must. Listen to it. John 10, 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold that weren't alive even at the time. Them also I must bring. <laughs> I must bring them and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. He said in that same chapter, John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It's not an offer or, or some kind of a contingency plan. It doesn't say, I sure hope my sheep will hear me and follow me. They will, they do. He must bring, because he brings them. <laughs> no man can come except the Father which has sent me. Draw him. Why must he bring his sheep? Same chapter, John 10. I lay down my life for the sheep. He bought them, he redeemed them, and he's going to have them. That's why he must bring them. He redeemed them with his precious blood. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep, and they shall never perish. That's cause and effect. The reason they will never perish is because he laid down, well, he laid down his life for everybody. No. Nope. Whoever he laid down his life for shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of his hand. You want to know whether that's you or not? Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You. It's not a coincidence or a random arrangement that the words of verse 45 follow the word me. Look at it. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What's the word before that? Verse 40, the last word of verse 44. Me. That's not a coincidence. You're never going to understand the scriptures until you see by God's grace that every word concerns his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. Christ is the key to the scriptures until and unless you know him, the scriptures will always be a locked and closed book to you. You'll never understand it. When you see him as God reveals him in the gospel, you'll understand the scriptures. And not until. And if your understanding of the scriptures leaves you with the thought. Here's the, I, th I believe this happens a lot with people. Pretty sure it does because I'm people. And I 
I've, I've been there. If your understanding of the scriptures leaves you with the thought, I've got to start living better. I'm going to have to start living better. Then you don't understand the scriptures. The Lord hasn't opened your understanding. Your living better will land you in hell where you belong. That's what it'll do. Your, your better is sin. All of your righteousnesses, according to the word of God, are as filthy rags in the sight of God. You don't got to start living better, aren't you glad? <laughs> You've got to have Christ. That's what's got to happen. You've got to have the Son of God. And when and if you have Christ, then you're going to want to honor him. You're going to want to honor him with your life. If your understanding of the scriptures has you thinking that Christ dying on Calvary has given everyone a chance to be saved, if they'll just make the right decision about it, then God has not opened your understanding that you might understand the scriptures. So look at verse 45 again. Then he said concerning me, all of the scripture that had been written at that time, he said, concerns me. And his word is powerful now. He, he, he speaks to your heart through the gospel now and, and op opens understandings, or not, as it pleases him. Now, that they might understand the scriptures. They knew who God is, not because they made a decision for him, but because he did something for them. That's my testimony. What he did for them here in that verse 45, that's called salvation. That's what you call that. Turn with me, please, and look very carefully with me at 1 John 5.20. 1 John 5.20. This is the testimony of every believer. What he did for them there in verse 45, he does for all of his people. All of, all of those that he loved from eternity. Look at 1 John 5.20. And we know, you know that everything you know, you think you know some things, don't you? Everything you know is what God told you. Everything else you might be pretty sure about, but you may find out it ain't what you thought it was. Everything we know is what God said. And we know that the Son of God is come. He's God with us and hath given us an understanding. He hasn't appealed to us to do our best to understand. He's given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. That's how you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and salvation, eternal life. For, for the Son of God to give you, and no man knoweth the Son, save the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Thank God he does that. The Lord Jesus decides who is saved, who is not. He gives understanding and life as he pleases. God in all of his persons decide that. They decide who lives and who dies. He quickeneth whomsoever he will. John 5, 21. This is the Lord speaking. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth, which means give life, gives life, to whom he will. The religion of this world has everything backwards and upside down. They say, 
Salvation is, is, uh, is by the free will of man. Salvation is according to God's will. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He chose his people before the foundation of the world. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief. He chose you to salvation. He gave you faith in his Son, belief of the truth. Salvation is by the free mercy and love of God without any regard to anything man does or decides. Romans 9, 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, of God. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Somebody said, I don't understand how God could just love one and hate the other. How can God hate sinners? question is, how can God love sinners? It takes a miracle of his grace to save a sinner. Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? No, there's unrighteousness with us. God forbid, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That's why he said, I love Jacob. I hate Esau. Because he decides who gets mercy and who don't. They both needed mercy. And one of them got some of it. Because God loved him. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Well, what are we going to conclude from that? So then, it is not of him that willeth. Shut up about that. Quit preaching that if you hear this and you're a preacher or an advocate of the free will of man. Salvation. Who gets mercy and who don't? It is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, or of him that striveth, him that worketh, him that earns it, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And how does he show mercy? On whoever he wants to. That's what it just said. I, I, here's what I recommend, that you beg God for mercy. What the Lord did for these disciples in our text, he doesn't do for everybody. Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said unto them, it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Talking to his disciples, it's given unto you to know. You see how that directly applies to our text? It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He had to open their understanding. Why? Were they low IQ people or something? That has nothing to do with it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That's all. We're all born natural of the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And if you know the Lord Jesus, one day when it pleased Him, you were born of the Spirit. But originally you were born of the flesh. And you're a natural man. And you can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. And there's two reasons given. First of all, they're foolishness unto him. To most of this world, what we believe, our very hope, is ridiculous. Neither can he know them. That's reason number two. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. Not, not, not naturally, spiritually. God has to give understanding. And I'm not saying that these disciples didn't know the Lord before this. You might think, well, they were law. They didn't even understand anything. No, what we see here 
is that just as we need the Lord to reveal himself to us by the Holy Spirit for the first time, whenever that happened for you, I'm not sure exactly the day or the, that the Lord revealed himself to me, but I know he did. And listen, I need him just as much this morning to open my heart. Just as much. To open my understanding, to show us in all of the word of God the things concerning himself. If he doesn't do that, I'll get off on some kind of a tangent. I'll get on a soapbox. I'll argue with people from the pulpit. I will air personal grudges from the pulpit and do stupid things like that. The Lord's got to give me understanding. He's got to show me himself in every word so that I can proclaim that. Proclaim his truth. And we pray for that. I'm nothing, I have nothing and can do nothing without the Lord Jesus. You know, he told us that plainly. We were talking on the way over this morning how plainly in the word of God things are revealed and people just do the opposite. We were talking about that brazen serpent that was raised up in the wilderness and the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus like that serpent was raised up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that serpent was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, in likeness of the problem, in likeness of the curse. It was a serpent that represented Christ. How can that be? Because the serpent was the problem and the Lord Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin that he might condemn sin in the flesh and redeem his people. He had to become a curse for us on Calvary. And he said, even as that serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And we were talking about that later in the scriptures, it, it shows how that the people started worshiping that serpent, that, bra that brass serpent. And some wise king said, you know, I'm going to tear, I'm going to destroy that thing. We're not to be worshiping that. And it says in the scripture, he called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan. You know what that means? A piece of brass. What are you doing worshiping a piece of brass? What are you doing worshiping a statue? What are you doing worshiping a shape that God never ordained in the scripture that anybody, even in the Old Testament, and we don't make a mercy seat this morning, we don't make any of those things in the Old Testament and worship by symbols and pictures and types. The Lord Jesus Christ has come and revealed himself to us. We look to him, not types and pictures and shadows. And the cross is not even one of the shadows. What are you doing worshiping a piece of gold or a piece of silver? The Lord clearly reveals in his word things that we just ignore and deliberately despise. And this is one of them. Listen, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? If we abide in Christ, he'll, he'll, he'll make it so that the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, faith, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, will be born in us, will be brought forth. But listen to what he said next. For without me, you can do nothing. We forget that, don't we? Without me, you can do nothing. I am nothing. I have nothing. I know nothing and I can do nothing without him. Acts 16, 14, listen. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, Paul said. He, she heard us preach. Whose heart the Lord opened, 
that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. The Lord opened her heart, and that verse right there says clearly that she not only wouldn't have understood anything that Paul preached if he hadn't opened her heart, she wouldn't have even listened to him. She attended unto what he said because he opened her heart. I want with all of my heart, like Paul, to preach with great plainness of speech, to not ever be removed from the simplicity, the all-inclusiveness that's in Christ. But I can't give you spiritual understanding. We pray that God will do that for all of us. Verse 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Mm. Now, the word behooved, let's understand what this is saying first and just in, just in the grammar of it. The word behooved here is a little bit different than how we use that word. We might say, you know, to somebody, it would behoove you to do what I told you to do. <laughs> And uh, what we mean by that is it would be to your advantage to do that. You're going to regret not doing it, in other words. But it's important that we understand this word in the text. It simply means it was necessary. It had to happen. It had to happen. This is exactly what Paul preached in Acts 17 to. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. <laughs> you think about that, what Paul went through to get in that synagogue. He was a traitor to them. And yet they knew him because he was one of them before. But he, he, uh, he believed on Christ. Christ revealed himself to him. and He wasn't, he wasn't welcome in places that, that he was before. The, the true believers didn't trust him at first until God told them, look, I've chosen him. I've, I've chosen him. I've redeemed him. But by, because they had a relationship with him before, the Lord opened the door for him to go into that synagogue. And a lot of places Paul went and preached, he was threatened with his very life. I'm pretty sure they killed him in one place. It doesn't say he was actually dead, but the Lord raised him up. He was stoned. And the Lord raised him up. And so he knew what was at stake here. But you know why he went through all of that and went in there and, 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 and said what he said? You know what, why he did that? To, and just in order to say this, Christ must needs have suffered. Christ, the one that you reject, the one that you despise, the one that you cried, crucify him. He had to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In other words, he was exactly who he said he was. That's what he went in there to preach at risk of his very life. It had to happen. And this is what, this is, um, this is, these are, here's the question. Why was it necessary for Christ to suffer? I've got several things here, but I'll be quick with it. Well, it says in the text, the first one, thus it was written. That's why. Because as we've already said, everything God says comes to pass exactly as he said it would. There are no maybes. There are musts in the gospel. All of the word of God must be fulfilled. And all of the word of God concerns Christ crucified. All of it. If it's not fulfilled, if everything God says is not fulfilled, then he's not God. Secondly, God's justice demanded it. With the sins of all of God's elect laid on Christ, he must suffer the wrath of God. God must and shall punish sin. The Lord Jesus Christ knew no sin, but he bore the wrath of God against my sin as my substitute. Thirdly, why did he do that? <laughs> Why did, I'm asking another question on the third one here. Why was it necessary for Christ to suffer? 
Because he loved me. Because he loved you if you're his. That's why he had to. Christ must suffer because he loved me. And his prayer was that all that the Father gave him should be with him where he is. <laughs> that they may behold my glory. That happens one way. Christ must needs have suffered and died for my sins on Calvary. The fourth thing, and, and I'm not sure I can say this right. I don't know, even after writing down what I've written down, I don't know if I can say it right. But it was necessary for Christ to suffer because of who he is. Now think about this with me. I think you'll know what I mean, even if I can't say it right. We know that God is not obligated to save any sinner. Mercy is free. He don't have to show mercy on you. He didn't have to. He's not obligated, but here's the thing. He obligated himself. He got, it's, and you know why he did that? Because of who he is. He is mercy. He is love. His mercy and grace is who he is. It's not just something that he m might do or may not do. You're going to be who you are and who God is, is love. <laughs> you can say God didn't have to have mercy on anybody at all. And I understand what you're saying. He's, he's all sufficient. He doesn't need anybody or anything, but he did have to. He did have to. You can't be love without loving somebody. <laughs> and you can't be the God of all grace without having grace on somebody. He has done all has, uh, that he has done for sinners because of who he is. It was also necessary that he rise again. How come? Why did he have to rise again? It says he did. He said he did. Because his sacrifice on Calvary was accepted by God the Father. He offered himself to pay for our sins and he paid in full. Otherwise, he don't come out of the grave. He'll just, he'll just stay dead and all of us will too. Because he obtained eternal redemption for us. He accomplished all that the Father sent him to do, including the perfect salvation of all those that the Father gave him, and now he reigns. He's raised and ascended and has a name which is above every name. Secondly, why, did he, why must he rise again from the dead? Because of who he is. <laughs> His sacrifice was sufficient because it's the blood of God. Death has no more dominion over him because he's the prince of life. And so that's the message. Christ must needs have suffered and to rise again because God said, I will have mercy. And there's only one way to have mercy on a sinner. There's only one way for God to even look at a sinner without putting him in hell. And that's for God, the precious blood of God to be shed and wash away your sins. Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It's really the same thing, isn't it? To preach that Christ must needs have suffered and to preach remission of sins. It's the same message, of course. Now, the Lord said this is what should be preached, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. This is what should be preached. And the context of this, of course, is key. Now, think about this. He described all the scriptures as concerning himself and to preach him is to preach repentance. You think about that for a minute. How is it, how is preaching Christ preaching repentance? 
because repentance is a change of mind. That's just all, that's all it means. The thing about it is, though, you can't change your mind about who God is and everything that God said because those things are spiritually discerned. He's got to reveal them to you. You can't do that by nature. Repentance is a change of mind. But what is it that you need to change your mind about? Christ. That's why preaching him is preaching repentance. Think about it for a second. You need to change your mind. Let's be specific now. Generally speaking, it's Christ. But let's be specific and see what that means. You need to change your mind about who God is. Most people think he's just the grandpa upstairs that, you know, is helping me through my life. And I might go to church on Christmas and Easter, you know, to show my appreciation for him giving me a raise this year. They, you know how people think. You need to change your mind about who God is. If you ever think that God ever tried to do anything, you need to change your mind about who God is. We need to understand, we need to change our mind about the holiness of God. He's got to put you in hell. That's what you need to understand. He's got to put you in hell unless you have Christ. And if he did, he'd be doing the right thing. You deserve it. That's what mercy means. Not getting what you deserve. How are you going to find out who God is? How are you going to? You got to know. You got to find out who He is if you're going to change your mind about Him. How do you find out who God is? Christ. Listen. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Remember what I quoted a while ago? No man seeth, knoweth the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. That's how you're going to know who God is, Christ. You're going to have to hear from Christ and believe on Christ and see him. By faith, you need to change your mind about what you are. Because most people think their good has outweighed their bad, you know. Because we're masters at justifying ourselves. Even some stupid, horrible things we've done. We've already justified ourselves for doing it. We had to do that. It was the right thing. So we, you know, everybody say, well, my good outweighs my bad. I'm a sinner. I'm an old sinner, you know. But you don't have any good. <laughs> there is in me, Paul said, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Nothing. Even my righteousnesses are filthy rags. But how am I going to know how sinful and wretched I am? By, by dwelling on my, the bad things I've done? No, I'm just going to end up justifying myself for those. Or at least think that I've done enough good to outweigh it. How am I going to know how wretched I am? Only by seeing Christ and Him crucified to see what it cost for him to pay the sin debt of his people. You need to change your mind about how God saves a sinner. How are you going to do that? By hearing the gospel of Christ and seeing Christ. You see, people think that, that God saves sinners by giving them a decision to make. Listen to Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. <laughs> He's called Jesus Christ our Savior because he has saved us in every way that a person can be saved. you got to change your mind about that now. Christ is salvation. Salvation is a person, not a decision. It's a person. You need to change your mind about Christ himself. How are you going to do that? Who he is? By somebody preaching who he is and what he did and why he did it and where he is now.
You've got to know that he is your righteousness before God or you don't have any. He doesn't just show you the path of righteousness and then you, you know, go about to establish your own righteousness. Paul said that was the Jews' problem. It wasn't the solution. Their problem was they were going about to establish their own righteousness and has not submitted to Christ who is the end of the law for righteousness to those that believe on him. You've got to know that his precious blood is salvation. That he shed his precious blood for his people and redeemed them with it. It's not a contingency. It's not left up to you. He obtained eternal redemption for somebody. According to the word of God. Whoever his sheep are, he said they're not ever going to perish. Why? Because he laid down his life for them. That's why. And then remission of sins has got to be preached. That's what should be preached. Remission of sins. Remission means release from bondage or imprisonment, comma, forgiveness or pardon. Pardon. This is what Christ accomplished on Calvary. This is what he accomplished. Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put somebody's sins away by sacrificing himself. Hebrews 9, 26. Remission doesn't mean that you've got a shot. Remission does not mean that you have a decision to make. It means your sins are gone. It means they're put away by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus gave himself for his people on Calvary. If he did that for you, your sins are gone. And you stand in the sight of God, spotless and holy and without blame, before him in love. Did he die for me? You reckon the Lord died for me? I guarantee you this, if he did, I'm saved. You think he did? You think he died for me? Did he die for you? When he shed his precious blood on Calvary, did, did he die? Did he do that for you? Well, you're not going to be able to answer that question until you answer this one. Do you believe on the Son of God? You say, well, then we do have a decision to make. No, nope. faith's not a decision. It's a gift. It's a gift of God's grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I want to close with this passage of Scripture. If you'd turn there with me, John 6, 35, if you would, please. This is the answer to that question. Did he die for me? Here's your answer right here. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. In other words, they'll never lack anything they need. But I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not, You've seen me and believe not. He said in John 10 to the Pharisees, you, you don't believe on me because you're not my sheep. You've seen me and believe not. And look what he said next. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And remember now, he that cometh will never hunger or thirst. He that cometh, come into Christ is salvation. All that the Father giveth me will be saved. They're going to come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You see, they're the same ones. If you come to the Lord Jesus Christ with God-given faith and believe on his son and cast your soul before him and say, Lord, if you will, this is not my will. This is your will. If you will, you can save me. Have mercy on my soul. 
He's not going to turn you away. He's never, he never has. If you're playing games with God, then you're, you have no hope for now until you don't play games with God anymore by his grace. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Come and take the water of life freely. Are you thirsty? Then drink. Drink freely, without money and without price. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Nobody he died for is going to hell. Are you kidding me? Nothing is clearer than that in the word of God. And there again, we just, religion, the whole world's religion just utterly rejects that. All that the Father giveth me are coming to me. And those that he gave me, I'm not going to lose any of them. but should raise it up again at the last day. That sounds a lot like salvation to me, doesn't it? You? <laughs> and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, do you see him? These disciples saw him standing in front of them with wounds in his hands and feet, but that's not what saved them. He had to open their understanding that they might know who he is from the scriptures. That's what has to happen for you this morning. God's only ever saved sinners one way. He saved Moses the same way he saved me. By grace through faith in his son. That everyone which seeth the son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I'll raise him up at the last day. You see, it's the same thing. Those who are saved and raised up from the dead at the last day to meet him in the air and to be with him forever are those the Father gave him, and they're those who come to him by grace through faith in him. That's what should be preached. And this is why we preach him. There's no remission of sins but by the blood of Christ. There's no repentance until you know who he is. You know him and you'll repent of everything wrong about God and the things of God that you've ever thought. These are written that you might believe on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name.